I was just gonna say something derogatory towards crams or. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Listography. Jason and Joe here. Cram has the week off this week. This is the second week of uh, weeks where each of us are taking a turn off. And we're using that opportunity to cover some acts that maybe won't draw like the most views for the channel, and but maybe they'll draw in some new people. And with Cram off, I think Joe and I both like country music a good bit. Crams are not so much, especially straight country. We figured it would be a good time to dip into that genre, which we haven't really looked at a lot on the channel. You know, I've wanted to do a, a country discography for a while now, but all the classics are have such large discographies. Willie Nelson has like 95 albums and it's just absolutely insane. So we were looking for someone that had a slightly smaller discography. We landed on Dwight Yoakam, 18 albums. And I also think Dwight's maybe a good place for us to start with the country genre because he does incorporate a lot of rock sounds, a little rockabilly, a little bit of soul uh, on some of his records. So uh, kind of dipping our toe in the, into the country pool with this one. Yeah, I, I do think Dwight's kind of like the perfect introduction to people who are scared of like country music, especially, you know, kind of in his middle, like right after the debut, he gets into a zone where it's it's not that far from like the Eagles and, and Tom Petty. And it's not it's not like scary, like Garth Brooks kind of country. It's it's very much based in like the rockabilly up tempo stuff. It would have been cool when these guys like broke through in the 80s to see they had a, a big impact on country music, the kind of rejuvenated Bakersfield sound. And they were all over the clubs in LA. And I remember my dad talking about people like Dwight and the Blasters and Lone Justice, and they were kind of a big deal. So uh, that would have been cool because I do like Dwight a good bit. And he almost made a couple of my top fives. And now after this, yes, he, he has. He's overtaken one year in, in particular, which we'll get to. But yes, Dwight's made quite an impact. I've listened to some of these albums like five, six times. I can't get enough. Yeah, I was vaguely aware of Dwight Yoakam when I was like a little kid. I, I kind of remember him coming out but, and like people talking about him, but I didn't like country as a kid. I remember my mom was a Randy Travis fan and I would always be like, oh, country is terrible. But I, I feel like when my taste started to shift away from heavy classic rock, Rush, Dream Theater, all that stuff towards more singer songwriter related things. It was inevitable once I started going down that path. I was just moving closer and closer and closer to country. It starts with like, you know, Tom Petty and, and artists like that. And then you're discovering things like Lucinda Williams and Wilco, which leads you to Uncle Tupelo. And it just eventually you end up realizing, uh, I think I actually like country music. So heading into this, I knew the last three. I listened to those when they were released. And I knew the first... Um, four I think so I knew the early ones and the later ones didn't know anything in the middle I first heard uh, the first album from Dwight I listened to was Secondhand Heart back in 2015 I think and I really liked that and I kind of eventually got around to exploring more of his discography but I never listened to the whole thing but there were some tracks and some albums that I, I listened to after after hearing Secondhand Heart for the first time somewhat familiar but there's still a lot of surprises and things that i'd never heard before all right well without further ado uh 18 records i guess we'll do four at a time for the first two rounds uh at the bottom the obligatory country christmas album come on christmas it's a christmas album that's about all you can say it's pretty good probably slots like under the beach boys as far as like big star country albums goes I'm going to give it three stars. Uh, and that's the bottom for Dwight. So it's a lot of uh, big stars for Dwight, my boy here. Uh, 17, I got South of Heaven, West of Hell. It, uh, 
This is part of like his failed like movie that he was producing or directing. I think he directed it, starred in it, did the soundtrack for it. There's a bunch of good songs on here, but there's all sorts of like dialogue interspersed. Like he did the whole Quentin Tarantino thing where you do like a song and then like a little snippet from the movie, but the dialogue from the movie isn't very good. And it kind of just ruins the whole flow of it. I think maybe there's, there'd be a good album in there, but uh, as a actual album experience, it's not great, but still three stars because there's some good tracks kind of in there. Just, I don't know. If you're on Spotify, you can make a playlist of the good, good stuff. Number 16, I got Swimming Pools and Movie Stars, bumping up to 3.5 stars. This one pretty much just remade his early stuff, but as bluegrass kind of e and it's good but it's with an artist like this like i've already heard by the time i got to this album i already heard all these songs before most of them you've already heard before acoustically with dwight yokum acoustic.net so it's, it's kind of you know padding out the stats with this one uh, it's fine it's good it's a good listen three and a half stars but just nothing like super surprising or uh, out of the ordinary. And then my final one here is going to be A Long Way Home. The Curse of 1998 strikes another one. Uh, I was really hoping like when I saw that he had an album from 1998, kind of still in that classic period, I was like, all right, come on, Dwight. All you need is a four star and you can take this year and didn't quite do it. I do like this album, it's three and a half stars. It's, you know, right on the edge of four. A little return to like the honky tonk, a little more classic Buck Owens. He was kind of getting away from that, getting a little more mainstream, a little more rock before this. And he kind of readjusts his course back to the, the countryside. And it's good. It's, uh, it just feels a little safe. And it's just the run he was on leading up to this was so good that it, it's almost a disappointment when you get to this album because it's like, okay, his classic period might have, have ended, uh, but it's still a good album and I like it. And it's probably one I didn't listen to quite enough. So maybe I can bump it up in the future. But for now, it's just going to be my number 15. Yeah, that is one we disagree on a bit. I don't I don't see it as like the, I don't see the run up to that being great because you got the covers album and the Christmas album right in front of it. So to me, that was like. I don't know. It's like an oasis in the desert because then it, the acoustic album comes right after it. But uh, we'll get into my list now. Number 18 is that acoustic album. It's called Dwight Yoakam Acoustic.net. And why it's called that, I have no idea. I don't think it was released on the internet or anything like that. Um, so weird name for it. This is one of those kind of contractual obligation type records. I think he was trying to get out of his deal. It's way too long. It's It's so long. 25 tracks honestly if, even if it was cut down to a single album like 10 11 tracks it would be way too long like all the arrangements are exactly the same it's just him playing acoustic guitar and singing honestly like a five track ep would have been sufficient and you know a lot of the reviews of it that i read said that you know it really shows off his voice and his songwriting which i guess it does but it's not like he's T-Pain or something who's been singing behind auto-tune and like no one knew he could actually sing. Like you can hear his voice plain as day on all of these records. He's fantastic. The songwriting's good. It's well showcased. So there's really no need to like strip it down like this. I did not like this very much at all. I have it at two stars. My number 17 is Under the Covers which is a covers record. We should mention also, I guess we forgot to do that beforehand. He has a couple records that we're not including that are like, I think one's a covers record and one is like a compilation. We're counting this covers record under the covers because it was made as a studio record. The other ones were like taken from other places and kind of just compiled. So uh, this one's from 1997. It's kind of a mixed bag. Some of the song selections seem forced and then the arrangements that he puts onto those uh, songs are forced. It seems like he's just doing it to prove his versatility. He's just forcing himself to do the songs these ways instead of choosing the correct way to do the song or the, the version that works. 
it's just like variety for variety's sake. It feels like there's like a big band swing jazz version of uh, the Kinks, Tired of Waiting, which is so horrible, really, really bad. Uh, I don't think his version of Wichita Lineman is very good. His version of the Beatles, Things We Said Today, I don't think is very good. I think the one saving grace of this is uh, his bluegrass cover of Train in Vain by The Clash. But even still, I don't really think we needed that. Uh, and I've got this one at two stars as well. My number 16 is Come On Christmas, also from 1997. And again, it just feels like him trying to prove something rather than doing good versions of the songs or trying to like invoke a Christmas spirit. I don't know why these songs were done these ways. It doesn't, I don't think the arrangements work at all on this record. I have it at two stars. That's it for the two stars. At, at two and a half stars, I have South of Heaven, West of Hell from 2001. And I think Joe nailed it pretty much. There's some decent songs, but all of the dialogue in between just really disrupts the flow. It's not really a good listening experience. I also think the mix on it is a little harsh, but I think the track Somewhere and No Future Insight are probably the highlights. And it's worth noting this, this record had a huge impact, the fact that he made this on the rest of his career. Basically, he his financier for the movie that he was writing, directing, starring in, pulled out at the last minute and he went all in and put all his own money towards financing it. He sold his home in Malibu. Um, his production company filed chapter 11 bankruptcy. And as a result, he had to hire cheaper musicians to tour. And he had a falling out with uh, Pete Anderson, who was his uh, guitar player from the beginning and producer. So yeah, really changed uh, the course of his career trying to make this movie. So uh, interesting how that played out. Uh, we will get to that in a bit. Okay, well, we have some major disagreements, <clears throat> beginning with my number 14, Under the Covers. I literally disagree with everything you said about this one. Uh, I don't like Train in Vain. I think it seems forced. Tired of waiting for you. Okay, you're right about that. That one's not great. But everything else, I think, is pretty darn good. I love his version of Wichita Line, but I think it's probably the second best version of that I've ever heard. I like the last time, the, the Stones cover, and I think the Beatles cover is pretty fun as well. Claudette from Orbison and Playboy, also pretty darn good. Baby Don't Go, Duet with Shell Crow isn't very good either, but I think there's enough on here to make it interesting, so I give it three and a half stars. Number 13, I got and all of these, basically from nine to 13, are so close. I just kept shuffling them around, but uh, I'm gonna go with Population Me, his final one with Pete Anderson. Uh, turns down the electric guitar a little bit. There's more acoustic, more banjos, more dobro, definitely more twang in his voice, a little more classic country sound. And it is, it's good for what it is. It's like an indie country record. It's just not quite as exciting as what he was doing before. Uh, pretty bad with Willie Nelson, if Teardrops were Diamonds. But this kind of period, right around like the, the 2000s, kind of just nothing from this era is going to make my top 10 songs. I think it all sounds good, but it kind of blends together a little bit. And Population Me is sort of just one of a couple that I probably didn't listen to enough, but uh, it's, it's still very good. It's three and a half stars. Number 12, I got Dwight Sings Buck. And it's hard to judge these cover albums because they're they're very good. Like he's, he sings the, the Buck Owen songs really well, but it is, it's a covers album. And he was sort of like made to do this. It's almost like too easy. So I don't know, it's three and a half stars. It's very good. Again, all of these albums are almost flawless. It's just a matter of like, I can't give everything like four stars. So this is gonna be three and a half. And uh, I love, love his cover of Above and Beyond because that's just a perfect song and he does it really well. And yeah, it's, it's Dwight Yoakam singing Buck Island. So there's no way that can go wrong. My number 11 is going to be Tomorrow's Sounds Today. And I had this higher and then I dropped it a little bit and it just all kind of, 
again, this is 2000. So he's got a little, he, he went back to the twang a little bit. A little more, you know, his violins, there's lots of steel, lap steel guitars. He's got like, like yokel vocal, like <gasps> kind of hiccup going back again, which he kind of got out of in the, in the 90s a little bit. Good songs on here, free to go. I really like awesome guitar work. And I really like the dueling solo between the electric and the steel lap guitar. But it's just nothing like really jumped out. Like a lot of good songs. Every one of these songs, there's no songs you want to skip. It's just slightly more anonymous than some of this classic period. So three and a half stars for that one too. But again, it's, it's like right on the cusp with four stars. I think our list might end up being differenter than I expected them to. My number 14 is Secondhand Heart from 2015, co-produced by Chris Lord Algae. To me, I love the record before this, Three Pairs. I think it's a really great sounding, really warm sounding record. And this one is mixed just like a big stadium rock record. The producer, Chris Lord Algae, is well known for making kind of big sounding rock records and mixing a lot of different artists. But to me, this thing is just like one of those records that sounds like it was uh, just over compressed and, and trying to make it too loud and too big and everything's like too in your face. The band sounds like it's having a lot of fun. They're just kind of like blasting through the songs. But at the same time, it just doesn't feel as considered. I think all of Dwight's records have really, really great arrangements on pretty much every song across the board, like has, has a perfect arrangement and they all sound really great. And to me, it, this is the one record where it feels like he didn't consider the arrangements very much at all. And they just got in a room and played and blasted through the tracks, which for, I'm sure for him was a lot of fun, but I don't think it translates that well to the record. For me, the best track is the closer, um, the kind of ballad, These of Birds. So yeah, it's a three-star record for me. I think there's some good songs on it, but um, probably not one I'll go back to often. And my next pick, potentially, I mean, I don't know how much controversy is going to be stirred on a Dwight Yoakam video, especially with our audience, unless a bunch of Dwight Yoakam fans descend on this video and get really mad. But my number 13 is his biggest selling album, I have this time. And to me, this record has uh, three songs that went to number two on the country charts. The record went triple platinum. Uh, just to me, this record, it sounds really sterile compared to all the ones that came before it. I read they recorded this on Pro Tools. Um, I don't know whether or not they did with the previous record, but this one just sounds kind of just lifeless to me, especially the opening on a pocket of a clown. The first track, the drums on it sound really, really chintzy. Like they could have been programmed. Maybe the backing vocals sound like really weirdly robotic and lifeless. And I think that carries through a lot of the record. I think the songs just, uh, don't sound good, a little corny sounding. And I think this is the closest he ever veered to the pop country that he always railed against. I do still think there's some good songs on it. I think it's about a 50-50 split of songs I like and songs that I don't really care for. But yeah, for me, it's a little dangerously close to the pop country that I'm not a big fan of. And I think the production is not good on this one very, very much at all. So three stars on that one. My number 12, is going to be Dwight Sings Buck. I think a much better covers album than Under the Covers. His entire career is basically built on loving Buck Owens. So like Joe said, he was basically born to make this record. I think it's well-performed. I think it's, you know, made with love. His voice is amazing. He sounds great on it. And it's some of the best country songs ever written. So can't really go wrong, but at the same time, it's a covers record. And if I want to hear these songs, I'm still going to go to the Buck Owens originals more often than not. I just think they're kind of unbeatable, as good as Dwight is and as well as he does them. So it's a good record, three and a half stars. I'm glad it exists. Hopefully it, you know, directs some people to the Buck Owens uh, catalog that wouldn't otherwise discover it. But yeah, just would rather listen to the originals on that one. My number 11 is... Swimming Pools, Movie Stars, dot, 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 uh, Bluegrass remakes of his back catalog. 
I think this works much better than the acoustic remake album that he did. Especially, I think there's a few songs on this that kind of teetered on being a little too poppy in their original form. Especially, like I said, on uh, this time, Two Doors Down, I think is a really big improvement over the original version. Um, so I give it three and a half stars. It's a, it's a good listen, but, you know, it's maybe a, like a 50-50 split to whether or not I'd rather listen to the original version or, or this version of the songs. That was end with a cool cover of uh, Purple Rain, though, which is interesting. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. That's it works pretty well. Like for you wouldn't expect that to to work at all, but he's very good at at making cover songs and turning things into like a honky tonk. All right, let's get into the top ten. My number 10, this is a critic's favorite and sounds like you also enjoyed it a lot, Jason. I got three pairs from 2012, kind of his comeback album. A little more straightforward rock, I think. He kind of put the, the honky tonk down a little bit. Take hold of my hands, pretty straightforward. Sounds like a, a Tom Petty number, but Yoakam does have that exaggerated like hillbilly hiccup still in his vocals. He's still doing that thing, which I like. I really like the, the ooh, thing at the end of the, the lines there. I don't like Waterfall, a little too cutesy, but his cover of Dim Light Stick Smoke is very good. That has a lot of honky tonk in it. Never All Right, Heart Like Mine, sounds pretty close to his, his original kind of early 90s, late 80s stuff. And all these songs are good. I don't think there's a bad song on here. Maybe Waterfall, but everything else, pretty darn good. I have it three and a half stars still. It doesn't quite excite me like his his other stuff and or his next record, Secondhand Heart, which I really liked. I like the, the change kind of in the sound of that one, but nothing wrong with three pairs. Don't let my early negativity fool you because I really love doing this. Uh, this was one of the more enjoyable discographies that we've done recently. I've got four stars from here on out. Uh, so I like all of these a lot. It was really hard to put the 10 in order. Uh, but for me, number 10 is going to be Buenos Noches from A Lonely Room. Interestingly, this record contained his only two number one country singles, Streets of Bakersfield and I sang Dixie. I think it sounds, the sound of the record is very similar to the first two records, I think. Kind of a, a trilogy in a way. But I, I, the thing that's missing from this that keeps it a little lower on my list than the others, it just doesn't really have the energy. It doesn't have like those barn burner, like honky tonk tracks. A lot of this record is a little bit slower. There's some really cool like textural things going on with guitars and stuff. And it's really cool. It's a good record and there's some really great songs on it. Just a, the energy is a little down on it. I still think it's really great. Four stars, but it's as high as I could put it because so many of these other records are great. Yeah, I agree. It's not quite on my list yet, but I saw a lot of people putting this like at the top and five stars from all music and I didn't quite get as much out of it. A lot of it, it's very murder heavy, uh, which, you know, take that as you will. My number nine is going to be Blame the Vein. This was his first without Pete Anderson. So to compensate a little bit, he really honky tonks it up. A little more countrified, I think, close. He's leaning back into the, the Bakersfield sound. I think the, the production, the sound isn't quite as good. And the playing, you know, I, I do miss Pete a little bit with some great orchestration on the last heart of the line, that's really nice. I think it's just missing like that one killer, one or two killer cuts for me. I think it's uh, it's good though. Oh, that's, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. It's just another good album from Dwight Yoakam. All right, my number nine is going to be a record called Gone. This came out in 1995. This is the record that followed up his uh, big blockbuster with This Time. And he went from selling like 3 million copies of This Time to selling like 300,000 of this. And it's interesting because this is considered like his experimental record. And it's, it's funny to me how like the country music world operates kind of because 
it's so similar. Like there's a mariachi horn kind of on the opening track and he does a couple like slightly different things. He's tweaking the formula some, but, but to think that country music radio wouldn't play tracks from this because it was so like considered wide, wildly different is just bizarre to me. I don't really understand that, but lots of good songs on it. Near You is great. Kind of got this birdsy jangle to it. Never Hold You is really cool. Baby, Why Not? It's got this kind of Tex-Mex flavor to it. Uh, One More Night's great. Heart of Stones kind of sounds like an old Patsy Cline ballad. Uh, really cool. So cool record. I think that he was upset with how this record was promoted. Probably rightfully so, because I mean, the songs on it are just as good as on this time. I think the production's way better. So uh, I don't know. It's it's an interesting. It's kind of a different world. The country music, uh, especially when you're talking like Nashville and and the, the songs that actually go to radio, it's kind of a an interesting uh, thing to look at. But uh, four stars for me. Really good record. I am now entering my four star territory, and I'm doing it with Dwight Yoakam Acoustic uh, Never thought I would say that, but I really like this one. I I think it's great. I think. For an acoustic, this might be my favorite acoustic album of all time because basically it's a greatest hits. So you're getting all the good stuff. It is long, but I never felt like I was like dragging on this one. I, I thought just Dwight and his guitar sounded great throughout. I liked all these songs the first time he played them, you know, with the whole band and with Pete and everything like that. But I just think these songs, this format, it's a little magic to it that uh, really made me like it a lot more than I expected because I usually don't go for the acoustic stripped down. But uh, I think the guitars played really well, arranged really well, changed for acoustic really well. And I think Dwight's vocals, which were already great, are also really great on this. So it's kind of just like a greatest hits album for me. And I'm gonna give it four stars. I think it's great and it's just, but still, it's a covers album of himself, Greatest Hits, so it can't be any higher than number eight. My number eight is going to be A Long Way Home from 1998. Like I said previously, I think this is a great bounce back after the covers record and the Christmas record that I did not like very much at all. There's no covers on this, and I think it probably has his most natural and organic like production and sound to this point in his career. I might actually say that a few more times in this video, but uh, up to this point, I think it, it sounds really natural. Things Change is a great tune, which I think is ready-made for crossover success, but didn't make the country top 10. Yet to Succeed's a great song, a uh, really good ballad. Listen's cool. It's got this cool kind of a uh, Roy Orbison thing to it. Lots of good songs. I think maybe dips a little near the end, but really strong record. I, I've got it at four stars. I'll have to give that one another listen because I really wanted to get to four stars so I can jump on my 98 list. My number seven is going to be the first Dwight I ever heard. That is Second Hand Heart. And I like this better than Three Pairs, I think. Again, Jason and I always disagree on production, it seems. I like the, the production. It sounds very full. The rockers are, you know, the tempo is great. He's just ripping through this stuff. In Another World, the drums make it kind of sound like Full Moon Fever to me. And it has um, it's just a, a big, nice sound. And it, it sounds different, I think, than anything he'd done to this point, which I like. She kind of has like a 90s alternative college rock feel. Like I was getting a little like gin blossoms even with it. Uh, with Yoakam's Honky Tonk vocals, of course. You know, Dreams of Clay. Kind of getting a little Tom Petty, a little Black Crows. So it's a little more Southern rock, I think. And I really like his version of Man of Constant Sorrow. Uh, again, I'm getting like Georgia Satellite vibes, like this definite Southern kind of rock that he, you know, he dabbles and he's close to sometimes. But I think on this album, it really comes out. Maybe it is sort of the, the bigger, fuller rock production. I think the only thing that's like missing, and I kind of got the same thing with Three Pairs, just a little bit of the humor, I think, is missing from these later albums. I really like the way he, he would work in his sense of humor, the dark kind of self-deprecating humor, especially on the first like five or six albums. 
So this is a little more straightforward rock, but I still think it's great. Definite uh, four stars for me for this one. My number seven is Tomorrow's Sounds Today from 2000. This was the last record that he made for Reprise Records. The acoustic record came out between um, Long Way Home and this, but this, this is kind of a continuation of what he was doing on A Long Way Home. The things that he did right on that record, he does right here as well. There's some good kind of Bakersfield type of stuff on this record. Uh, there's a couple duets with Buck Owens. Both of those are great. And it kind of alternates between the classic country sound and uh, tracks that have a little bit more rock and roll and a little more pop to them. Uh, tracks like uh, Love Caught Up To Me and Free To Go. Both, I think, have uh, really catchy melodies and a lot of crossover appeal to them. It's a little strange to me that neither of those songs were um, singles because to me those are like obvious standout tracks uh, that would have been great for radio. The one downside to this record is the really bad cover of I Want You to Want Me. Uh, it's not good at all. I think, I don't know if it was a greatest hits record or some kind of compilation. Uh, it's not on one of his studio records, but he had a big hit with a cover of Crazy Little Thing Called Love. And that was right prior to this. So I think this was kind of a, a sad attempt at trying to recreate that by doing a, a classic rock tune in a, in a country form. Doesn't work this time at all. But other than that, it's a really, really strong record. I've got it at four stars. I love that cover of <laughs> Cheap Trick. I don't know why. Every cover he does, I think is just great. I uh, it just works for me. Forgot to mention that when I was doing the album. But yeah, I, I love his covers, man. I don't know what you're thinking. My number six is going to be, and this probably like, this is kind of bad for me to put this here, but it wasn't on Spotify, so I had to listen to it on YouTube, and the sound quality is never as good, and I didn't quite listen to it as much, but I got guitarist Cadillacs etc etc here at number six at four stars a lot of great songs on here uh the classic title track south of cincinnati uh the duet with maria mckee bury me is great and uh, a couple other covers he does honky tonk man he does ring of fire he does heartaches by the number which is uh, written by harlan howard so i'm guessing that was a buck owens not originally but buck owens did do it i think the first person was ray price maybe Okay. So there's, there's a bunch of bunch of covers on here, but I think the the template for his sound for the next 10, 12 years, basically just guitars, Cadillacs, that low like stuttering guitar part, the little like call and response between Dwight and Pete. It really kind of he'll kind of repeat that formula a bunch, and it's a great formula and it works pretty much every time. And you know, it's the Bakersfield sound, it's updated. He's got the honky tonk, the hillbilly, you know, not classic country, not the Nashville country sound, um, not that earnest kind of Randy Travis, which was, they were kind of around the same time. I think they were like the opposite ends of like the country spectrum. You had the very sincere Randy Travis and the sort of like kick ass, you know, shit kicker Dwight Yoakam over in in Bakersfield, California. And they're not like that dissimilar, but you know, I prefer the, the Dwight Yoakam country sound. Uh, a lot of great fiddle, a lot of like some bluegrass in there, especially in I'll Be Gone. I think the only quibble I have with this, other than I didn't get to listen to it as much as the other ones, I think his voice gets better in the next couple of years. The production gets better in the next couple albums and, and years. But this is a great album and uh, four stars. It'll probably be higher eventually if I get to listen to it a little, a little bit more times. All right, my number six is Population Me from 2003. This one comes after his uh, disastrous soundtrack record. And he ends up, after that, he ends up on a small label called Audium. So I don't think there was much fanfare around this record but I think it's really, really cool. A lot of California on this record that you can hear. I mean, Timothy B. Schmidt sings backing vocals on uh, a track or two. You've got 
uh, Bob Glob playing bass, who was a bass player uh, for a lot of singer songwriters in the 70s. Uh, I know he played with uh, Warren Zevon in particular. There's a duet with Willie Nelson. There's you got Earl Scruggs playing banjo on a track. So there's a bunch of guests. All of them contribute uh, excellently. A lot of um, good performances from everyone involved. And I think they the songs on this record show every side of what he does and it does it very well and it does it kind of in a natural way. It's not forced like on his covers record where he's like, I have to get this type of song on this record. I think it's a very seamless melding of all of his styles. I think the songwriting is all really good. The late great golden state, I think is a great, uh, that's one that has uh, Timothy B. Schmidt on it. An exception to the role is really good. I like no such thing a lot. This record I think is, a tick better than the records I've talked about so far in my top 10, but also a tick worse than what is to come. So it's either a weak 4.5 or a very, very strong four. It's right on the cusp. I'm not quite sure yet. Yeah. I mean, these, some of these records, yeah, I felt bad giving three and a half stars to, so I got to go back and bump them up a little bit. My number five is going to be, Buenos Noches from a Lonely Room. This one is filled with, with murder. It goes from like obsession to murder pretty darn quickly. I Got You, One More Name, where he's talking about if he hears one more name, he's going to leave. What I Don't Know, which with <laughs> the lyrics, uh, pretty grim. Uh, what I Don't Know could kill you. So he's like, progressing through this like murderous streak, which he kind of finally acts out on Buenos Noches from a lonely room to wear red dresses where he shoots wife or lover in the head. So there's some darkness, a lot of darkness on this one. It is kind of missing like those shit kicker, like hillbilly honky tonk, like up-tempo stuff. Home of the Blues, Johnny Cash cover is really good. And a couple other good covers I hear you knocking and send me the pillow, but it does just seem to be like missing that one, one or two really up-tempo tracks. I think his two um, number ones, I Sing Dixie, little hokey, like I get it and it's it's nice, but I just get it, you know, they, they play Dixie kind of during it and just seems a little like forced, a little like too much into play this on country like music stations uh streets of bakersfield is great though fun cover with buck owens and it's definitely four stars but yeah it's just missing like that one or two like rockers that he was kind of he was getting into on hillbilly deluxe and i think he would really get into on his next album all right my number five is three pairs from 2012 and I think judging just by the artwork alone, you would think that this is like a, going to be a dramatic departure. It looks so different from all of his other album covers. Just got these like black and white pairs, still life on the cover with a shadow, no text, really cool album cover. And then on top of that, you have uh, Beck produced two tracks on this record. So going in, you're, you're thinking this is going to be like a major reinvention, but again, it's just him kind of tweaking the formula as he goes with every record. Nothing ever really changes that much. Opens up phenomenally with Take uh, Take a Hold of My Hand, which incredible song. The bass tone on it is amazing. The bass opens the song. It sounds so cool. Co-written somewhat unbelievably by Kid Rock. Um, it kind of knowing that he was involved in that song kind of makes me question everything that I believe in my whole life. So, but great song. I really, really like Waterfall. I, I like the kind of cheesiness. I think it's an, an interesting kind of diversion from his usual writing style. Uh, probably the most atypical Dwight Yoakam song that there is in his whole catalog. Nothing But Love is really cool. It's got like these amazing cascading harmonies. Um, it's Never All Right is really soulful ballad with some nice horns. The worst song on it for me is the first of the two Beck tracks, A Heart Like Mine, which was I think the song that probably got the most press. I think Rolling Stone had it in their top songs of the year in 2012. But to me, the mix on that song sounds so different from the rest of the record. It doesn't fit in. It doesn't have the warmth that the rest, rest of the record have has. It's really harsh. There's a lot of reverb on it that kind of washes out the vocals. Kind of sounds like it's in an airplane hanger or something. I don't think it sounds good 
at all. The rest of the record sounds so good. Even the other Beck track sounds really good. Just not a fan of the way that one sounds. But overall, I think it's a really, really strong record. Some of his best songwriting and some of his best production. I've got it at four and a half stars. Right, um, we're up to number four. Yeah, number four. I'm still in the four star range, but it's getting close to the four and a half. I got his sophomore effort, Hillbilly Deluxe. Kind of just a continuation. I think, Jason, you said earlier, it was basically a trilogy, the debut, this, and Buenos Noches. And it, it really just continues the Bakersfield kind of sound that he was going for and established on his debut. Starts off great with Little Ways. Uh, just a great showcase for his voice, that low twangy guitar. Got a fiddle solo, nice kind of bluesy shuffle. Got some pretty ballads with Johnson's Love. Great steel guitar in that. So obviously we're both probably going to like it a lot. I bet we both have it on our top tens. I think there's some good mix of stuff. Um, you got the up-tempo stompers, Please Please Baby, Smoke Along the Track, Little Things. And you got just really good songwriting, reading, writing, Route 23. We're talking about going from the coal mines, the city factories, and still kind of struggling with, you know, the hillbilly, you know, mountains of Kentucky kind of stuff. A Thousand Miles, again, I, I, I think Dwight's a really good, astute, lyrical writer. Uh, a lot of like yearning and longing in these, in these songs but it's never like sappy or over the top. And he's very good observational. Like there's just little little things that make it very real. I think A Thousand Miles is a good example of that. Really nice harmonic guitar playing from Pete Anderson. Another good uh, fiddle solo. You got a uh, cover of Elvis's Little Sister, which is great. And it's just everything great about Dwight. Like the phrasing's top notch, the songs are great. You still got that distinct like country and he brings it a little Kentucky. He's from Kentucky. So it's not all like Bakersfield. He's kind of dabbling back in the Appalachian mountains of Kentucky, you know, violins and steel guitar and chicken picking and uh, everything like that. But it, it is rooted like in 12 bar blues a lot in the honky tonk. So you really do get like the, the bluesy rock and the countryside and the honky tonk. And uh, just a, a really great album. Probably should be four and a half stars, but I have it at four. Now nah, it's four and a half. We'll do four and a half. Bumping it up right now. Done. It's done. My number four is Guitars, Cadillacs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. His debut album, 1986. And you know he he left Nashville. He was only in Nashville briefly. Went to LA and started playing the rock circuit there basically he was doing shows with the blasters and los lobos and x and he kind of built up this reputation of being kind of like the rocker uh not afraid to uh you know go in that direction against the grain of the uh nashville establishment and i think right out of the gate with the first track honky tonk man i, I think it just sets the stage perfectly and you've got the great uh title track does the same thing open side two, just I think those two tracks really just announce to the world who he is what he's about what his sound is I think it's great to me the one thing on this record that doesn't work that well is ring of fire I just think it's too obvious and I don't think his arrangement of it is that great or or that different than anyone else has ever done it yeah I feel like every country artist does either that or walk the line and it's just been done to death I'm sure even by the by 1986, it had already been done to death. So that's the one track I could do without. The rest of it's awesome. And uh, Pete Anderson, we talk a lot about his production, but his guitar playing is unbelievable. He is a fantastic uh, country guitar player. Really tears the telly up. All right, we're getting top three. Another four and a half star one. This, this is one where Jason and I differ greatly. I got this time from 93 is my number three. And I guess I see that maybe this is like dipping perilously close to like pop. I guess pop country didn't really exist, but sort of the mainstream Nashville establishment country. And it's, it's emotional. I think the sentimentality laying on thick with uh, Home for Sale and Two Doors Down. But 
I think it works perfectly. I think it's a nice kind of change up from the previous album where he's kind of in like big rocker mode and he gets close to mainstream like a thousand miles from nowhere. I think is pretty close to like Tom Petty and ain't that lonely yet. It's pretty close to like normal Nashville country. I, I don't have a problem with production. I think the guitar work is exemplary as always. I think the arrangements are great. All the different instruments. Again, just this era of, of Dwight, I just can't get enough of so inventive guitar playing and the way it just all fits in. And I think these songs are pretty much just as, as good as he gets, as good as it gets. I think it's great. I got it at four and a half stars for this one. My number three is Hillbilly Deluxe. Second record from 1987 opens with a very obvious nod to Buck Owens with the you got your opens the exact same way that uh, Buck Owens track Tiger, Tiger by the Tail does, but then kicks into Little Ways, which is a great track. I think it's sonically very similar to the debut. Doesn't sound very different. I think it's a little more polished. There's a bit more reverb on it. I think the bass is a little fatter, sounds a little better, but I think the songwriting here is better, I, I think, just a, just by a, like a hair. And I was reading, apparently going into the first record, he had like 21 songs written. And the plan was to do like seven originals and three covers on each of his first three records. So he basically had the first three records written. And so it's interesting to me that this one of the first three feels the strongest like songwriting wise, just I guess by chance ended up with the, the stronger set of songs Joe mentioned uh, Johnson's Love, which is awesome, awesome track, great ballad. Little Ways, the opening track that I already mentioned is fantastic. And I think the playing is a little bit freer on this. I think the musicians get to sort of spread out a little bit more than they do on the debut, especially the fiddle and the pedal steel. There's a lot of really great playing from, from those uh, instruments. Uh, Pete Anderson takes a, a lot of great solos as well on this. His guitar solo on Little Sister is insanely good. Maybe uh, like if you're truly afraid of like, maybe not afraid, but if you really don't like country music and, and you're not into this discography at all, if you check out one thing, go listen to uh, Pete Anderson's guitar solo on Little Sister. It's phenomenal. It's, uh, I got this at four and a half. Well, top two, and I got two five stars at the top. My number two is going to be Gone. This album, I had no idea of its existence. Just never, never got around to it, never heard it mentioned, never heard any of the songs from it. And that Jason talked about it before the country, basically just the country radio or whatever, basically just said no to this one, despite him selling 3 million albums of this time and having a bunch of number two hits. They were just like, nah, not, not this time, Dwight. He went too far and it's not... Jason said, again, it's not that far from what he had already done. Like, yes, he did get the Rembrandts to do uh, guest vocals. He wrote these songs on electric. And Jason mentioned a little birds action that he heard uh, in Near You. I have the same thing. Uh, that, that like jangly 60s guitar. Good backing vocals from the Rembrandts. Uh, they will be there for him. But I think what separates this one from the other ones, the previous albums and the future albums, like there's some organ in there, like Dawn, That'll Be Me, is like this quick new wave beat, great uh, organ, like circus organ B3, I think. Kind of reminds me of like early Elvis Costello. Like it's, it's really cool. Not what I was expecting at all. Again, you get the great guitar throughout. Uh, especially on Nothing, uh, which has some great horns and some female backing vocals, great like cowboy power ballad. And then Never Hold You, close to like Georgia Satellites, Tom Petty, some harmonica, like big hay refrains, and some some classic country, One More Night and Heart of Stone, definitely have a that, like classic early, you know, 60s country feel to it. And I, I, I love the humor on the the opener, Sorry You Asked, where 
Dwight like continues to make excuses and backpedal. And like the song fades out and he's like still making these excuses. Like he has so much more to go. And then he, he's blaming like this woman's family for telling her to like leave him and stuff. It's just really funny. Like it's a perfect use of, of humor in country that you don't get this like in other genres so much. Like everybody's, especially in the nineties, everybody was so serious all the time. I really like the way Dwight and country in general, but Dwight I think is really good at it because he's, a better writer than most everybody else uh and i just think this one is so i mean it's not like wildly different but the way it kind of spreads its wings and like dabbles into some other stuff kind of elevated it for me and i think the songwriting is great and dwight sounds great and the guitar playing is great so i got it at five whole stars for gone from 1995 an album i had no idea existed but why we do this find those gems all right so i struggled with the top two and i really want to make cram listen to some of this <laughs> uh, i almost want to switch it now but my number two is if there was a way from 1990 i'm wanting cram off the hook this one made my top five in albums of the year for 1990, which I think is a miserable year for music. I don't think it would make most other years, but it's still a very good record. And as I mentioned, he, he kind of had the first three records written. I think he wrote a couple more songs along the way, but for the most part, he had a bunch of songs. This is the first record that he makes after those records that's like a clean slate, had to write a whole new batch of songs. And I think there's a little bit more rock and roll at play on this record. Actually, compared to the first three records, there's a lot more rock and roll at play on this. Takes a lot to rock you. Great song. Uh, Pete Anderson's playing on the whole record is especially great. He's doing all, like, even when he's not just like doing really flashy solos, there's all kinds of cool textural things. Does some like great tremolo type of stuff on Nothing's Changed Here. Uh, there's great solo on Dangerous Man. The title track of this record is like a straight up R&B soul tune with all this Hammond B3 organ all over it. I Don't Need It Done, basically like a, a Fats Domino kind of riff, the bass line, very similar to uh, Ain't That a Shame. You're the One's a great ballad with some uh, nice mandolin on it. I think it's a good sounding record, which is uh, quite a feat actually in 1990. I think even <laughs> records by bands that I like a lot in 1990 sound wise weren't making great sounding records and I, I think this one sounds pretty solid really really good record i wanted it to be number one but i think one just eked it out do you even know which one i have left joe no i was actually going back to look and like which one so it's a gotta be one of those nine two thousand ones i guess right i don't even know i have no idea blame the vein yeah yeah that's really odd to me uh really thought we were going to be simpatico on this one because yes if there was a way to make crams and listen to this uh, i would have loved it alas not to be but if there was a way is my winner 1990 i had this at number six when we did our albums of the year just missed i don't know what i was thinking because it is now my number one from 1990. It is five stars. And I think it is just like the best mix of everything. You know, Buenos Noches was off into like murder land. And this kind of brings it back like a little, little more classic country heartbreak, a little less murder. But there's also some bluegrass and that B3 organ making a little r and I think the, the lyrics are right you know, they basically swerve between earnest and that dark humor and sort of self-deprecation that he's so good at love love the opener the, that riff uh i can't get out of my mind I'm boom, 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 boom. just the way it starts off the whole thing and those great lyrics uh the exaggeration like that classic country exaggeration that he's talking about the distance you know climb a mountain shoot a gun into the sky half it's as, as high as the bullet goes is halfway between the distance between you and I. Perfect humor in that. And there's just some great songs. Takes a lot to rock you, baby. Just 
straight honky tonk. I think this is Pete Anderson's best sounding guitar work, his best work at all. Like it, it's country, but it's like half a step from like that Texas blues with like Stevie Ray Vaughan or, or ZZ Top, especially on Let's Work Together. It's just incredible stuff. I love the country sound. I love the honky tonk. I love the, the way it combines all these instruments, the guitar, the piano, fiddles and violins and banjos and steel lap guitar and acoustic. And it could overwhelm somebody, but the way it's all arranged on this one, it's just perfect. And Dwight's vocals, he's got this like lonely lovelorn kind of honky tonk vocal sometimes. He's got like a fiery, like real powerful vocal sometime, uh, like that Southern rock sometimes. And it's just a great melting pot of all these different styles. And the, the songs are just awesome. So since I started drinking again, got a little bluegrass, if there was a way, got that Hammond B3. Um, You're the one is waltz time, reminds me of the Eagles, like really pretty piano, great vocals, little, you know, strings and, and everything reminds me of uh, Hollywood Waltz by the Eagles a lot. Kind of has the old time LA feel to it. I don't know, this might be my favorite country album of all time. Like I don't think anything else could top it. So I guess I have to say this is the best country album ever made because it's, it's five stars and I, I don't know if I could find another country album that's this sort of like country leaning that I would give five stars to. So Dwight's done it. He's broken, broken the country. He's gotten five stars. He wins 1990. So a momentous day here at Listography. All right. Well, as we said, my number one is from 2005, Blame the Vein. Yeah, I just love it. Uh, it's on New West Records. He self-produced it. This is the first one without Pete Anderson. Keith Gaddis takes over on guitar. And I will say about um, Pete Anderson, as we've already said, phenomenal guitarist. And as a producer, I think he's really good at kind of, you know, getting the right songs and getting the arrangements right. But I don't think the records always sound that great. The early records sound a bit dated, kind of a product of their time kind of thing. A record like this time, just I, I don't like the production on that at all. And there's other times, you know, throughout the hit the tenure with Dwight that I, I don't think the records sound, not that I think they sound bad, but I don't think they sound as good as they could. And I just think Blame the Vein is a phenomenal sounding record. Uh, I wasn't really sure what to expect going into it, knowing that Dwight was self-producing. I didn't know it what it would be like. And it just, it sounds phenomenal. It sounds really great. And I just think it's the least self-conscious effort in his catalog. I think, except for maybe the debut, but I, I feel like even on the, on the better records, there's always kind of a struggle with within him and within the band of like, how far do we push it? Like how much rock do we want to bring into the sound? Do we want to play to the radio more? And I feel like he's always kind of thinking about those kind of things. And on this record, he, he feels totally um, unshackled by all of that. And he's just doing his thing. I think being on the smaller label on New West, I think he realized at this point in his career that he's not going to sell a million records and it's okay. And he can just make the music he wants to make. And I think it works so well. Uh, so many good songs on this. Lucky That Way, I love does it show is awesome. Three good reasons, just passing time. I've got it at four and a half stars. There's the one thing that keeps it from a five star record is the opening of she'll remember. It's got that weird like synth thing that happens. And he comes in with like this fake British accent. It's so weird and so out of place and it's long. It's not like a short intro. It takes like a whole minute or something. I'm not sure how long it is, but it's, it just breaks the, uh, the flow of the record. I don't know how, what the thinking was behind that. Other than that, it's it's pretty flawless. Well, you could have given me 25 guesses and I still wouldn't have picked that one as your winner. So that that that's weird. That surprises the heck out of me. I will have to go back and listen to it because I don't know, it, those 2000 ones kind of blended together for me despite the change from Pete Anderson producing to uh, the self-production on this one. So 
Well, I'll have to give another listen to see what I think. Well, so Dwight, um, I didn't think I liked him as much as I do, but I really do like him a lot. I think he is fantastic. And I really wish people would give him a chance to watch, you know, watch the video and then go, even if you didn't do it now, go back, listen to like one or two Dwight's and you'll really find, I think, just exemplary playing and songwriting. And basically, if you don't like Dwight Yoakam, you're a bad person. So, yeah, just give him a chance. I feel like, I don't know, like I talked about in the beginning of the video, it kind of my journey into country, I feel like, I, I feel like it needs to be a gradual process. Like you need to start with like country rock, Tom Petty, whatever, get into alt country, slowly move in this direction. Um, before you jump all the way in but i don't know for for some rock fans there's just a hard line in the sand no country and they won't they won't cross the line so i get it whatever uh but yeah i i enjoyed the week thoroughly yeah one of, one of my favorites in a while actually and as far as like ratings goes from top to bottom one of my my stronger um I'm trying to think who Obviously, like Zeppelin and like the Beatles are going to be stronger, but as far as like lesser known, you know, maybe in the 25 to 50, 50 to 100 range of my top 100, it would be tough to find an, an artist with this strong of a discography where there's just no lulls for me. Even, I mean, the Christmas album, sure, but pretty much everything else was a good, enjoyable listen. So, yeah, there it is. Dwight Yoakam's discography in the books. And I don't know if anyone will watch this video, if uh, anyone will make it this far into the video. Yeah, I don't know. But uh, if you did, thanks for watching, especially if you're one of our regular viewers. Uh, this is kind of out of the ordinary. So thanks for uh, coming on the journey with us. Even if you didn't listen to the records this week, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with our top 10 favorite Dwight Yoakam songs. And we'll have a side three for you on Thursday, Songs of the Year 1962 on Friday. And next week, Pram and I will be uh, ranking the records of Built to Spill. Lots of stuff uh, planned. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you're not already. Hit the bell for notifications. Hit like if you enjoyed the video. And uh, drop a comment down below. Let us know what you think of Dwight Yoakam. We'll see you in the next one.